Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Servo Motor Sizing and Selection for Robotic Applications, sponsored by Infranor. My name is Elizabeth Itell, and I'm an editor with Penton's Design Engineering and Sourcing Group. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the Help button. The logos you see on your console, including that of Infranor, are hotlinked. If you want to click on those during the webcast, feel free. This will not take you out of the webinar. We welcome your questions during today's event. Just type your questions as they occur to you in the question window on the side of your screen, and then hit the Submit button. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but feel free to send in your questions at any time. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Machine Design websites within the next week, and you'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Let me now introduce today's speakers. Dan Dequila has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Northeastern University. He has started in the motion control field in 1987 as an applications engineer with Pacific Scientific, later Danaher Motion. He went on to positions as field application engineer, field sales engineer, regional sales manager, application engineering manager, product marketing specialist, and program manager. He joined Infranor in 2007 and is currently the general manager. Robert Comstock has a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from MIT. Prior to entering the motion control field, he worked in the aerospace industry at General Dynamics, Raytheon, and the MIT Instrumentation Lab, later Draper Labs. Bob left Draper in 1980 to become engineering manager of IMEC Corporation to design drive electronics for brushless permanent magnet and induction motors. In addition to electronics design, Bob managed application support and worked with many customers to select motion control solutions for myriad applications. Currently, Bob is a consultant working with Infranor. Jack Curl holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. In 1990, Jack entered the motion control industry as an applications engineer for CMC Torque Systems. He moved on to Pacific Scientific in 1994 and later became Applications Engineering Manager. Jack went on to work at Almo Motion Control in 2006 as a field automation engineer. In 2007, Jack came to Infranor and is currently a Senior Systems Engineer. Now let me turn things over to our presenters. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome everyone to Servo Sizing and Selection. In today's webinar, we are going to, uh, we're going to try to demonstrate some pretty critical sizing topics, uh, and we're going to use an application, a two-axis robot application, to illustrate those topics. The first uh, axis we're going to look at is the traction drive axis. And that axis is going to convert rotary to linear motion, so that's the first topic we're going to cover. And we're going to select a gear reducer. When we do that, we'll take some time to discuss why we chose the gear ratio we chose and evaluate that a, a little bit more. The second axis is a uh, rotary uh, linear ax to linear axis also. It's a lift axis for, the, uh, the, for lifting the load. and. Um, so that, in that axis, we're using a ball screw to convert the rotary to linear motion. Of course, we're lifting against gravity, so we're going to evaluate the effects of gravity. We're also going to talk a little bit about inertia matching and why that's important when we're sizing servo applications. We're not going to spend time talking about servo, servo performance necessarily, but just understanding why inertia matching is important. Of course, as in level one sizing, we're going to then calculate the peak torque, the continuous torque, and the speed requirements for the application because those are the three items you need to select a motor. 
Um, speaking of level one, last year we did what we would consider servo level one sizing. That webinar is still available, and you, the uh, links are, the URLs are listed here. So please feel free to download those webinars and view them later if you have any, if any of the topics here are confusing to you. I also want to note that in this webinar, there, there's a lot of calculations. We're not going to spend a lot of time reviewing the calculations. We did put them in a format that should be easy for you to find later and review, but we want to spend more time on the critical topics and discussions rather than going through the calculations. Now, for today's example, we're going to, you know, there's many uh, examples of uh, autonomous robots moving around through warehouses and, and moving products through warehouses. We're going to focus on a robot that sort of looks like this one. And um, all, every time we do a sizing application, we're really looking at, we have to start with what the customer's needs are. And the customer really is the end user. And the customer needs, in this case, that we're going to focus on will be just really three things. One, that the maximum load that the robot needs to carry is 65 kilograms. Two, that the battery voltage is well regulated and always at 168 volts. That may be ideal, but that's what we're going to use. And three, the, um, the longest move, which Bob will discuss later, has to be done in about 40 seconds or less than 40 seconds. So those are going to drive us to make a lot of the decisions we're going to make today. And here is our simulated robot, and I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Bob Comstock. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for attending our webinar. Dan mentioned this is the system we will be analyzing. We have a robotic forklift with a mass of 190 kilograms. That's a weight of about 418 pounds, by the way. And uh, that includes a maximum load of 65 kilograms, or about 143 pounds of weight. The customer has specified a wheel diameter of um, 6 inches. That gives us a 3-inch radius. And one of the wheels is driven by a traction motor, while the other three are free to rotate. The lifting platform, with a mass of 4 kilograms, or about 8.8 .8 pounds, is driven by a ball screw, as Dan mentioned. We will analyze the motion shown here, which illustrates all the sizing concepts. The lift will raise the maximum load one foot off the floor. Then the robot will uh, move 100 meters to a delivery point at a speed of about 7 miles an hour. Then the load will be lowered to the floor, and that ends the motion that we're going to discuss. Obviously, in a real environment, the motions are going to be much more complex. But uh, this will really, uh, I think, uh, demonstrate all the key features of sizing that you have to consider in, in any application. The timing for the system is shown here. The load is lifted, lifted to position before the robot begins the 100-meter move. After the robot reaches the end position, the load is lowered to the ground. The time to lift the load is 1.8 seconds. The time to move the load 100 meters is 33 seconds and the time to lower the load is again 1.8 seconds. We're first going to be uh, finding the requirements for the traction motor and then select the motor meeting these requirements. The timing diagram for the traction drive is repeated above. You should be familiar with the formula for finding the distance traveled uh, because that was a subject in our previous seminar. The acceleration deceleration, deceleration rate is the um, change in velocity divided by the acceleration de or deceleration time, uh, or 3.125 meters per second, the, the speed, divided by one second, which gives us an acceleration rate of 3.125 meters per second squared. We will use this value of acceleration when computing the force required to accelerate the robot. This is the traction drive system. We have a motor driving uh, one six-inch diameter wheel through a 20 to 1 gear reduction. Our motivation for selecting 20, uh, 20 to 1 gear ratio will be discussed shortly. Our analysis will begin at the wheel and will work backwards through the gear reducer to the motor. Well, first, uh, 
why did uh, what did led us to select a 20 to 1 gear reduction? Well, it turns out that the cost and size of servo motors increase uh, with their continuous torque rating. So if you want more continuous torque, you've got to put it, uh, you have to buy a bigger motor that's more expensive and obviously takes up more space and more weight. A larger gear reduction uh, uh, reduces the required torque, but of course it also increases the motor speed and the gearbox speed. Fortunately, brushless servo motors are very well suited to high-speed operation, unlike brush motors that suffer from commutator arcing and accelerated brush wear at high speeds. Looking at a motor's torque speed curve, and we'll be doing that a little bit later, reveals uh, how fast the motor can run before there is a significant loss in torque. In our case, the limitation was the maximum recommended speed of the gearbox, which limited the ratio to 20 to 1. We will first determine the wheel of torque required for three, the three different segments shown, an acceleration segment, a constant speed seg segment, and finally the deceleration segment. Looking at the acceleration segment, the torque tau W1, and the W, by the way, uh, stands for the wheel. Uh, that's the torque being applied to the axis of the wheel. So it's the torque tau W1 required to accelerate the total mass of the robot. The torque tau W2 required to accelerate all four wheels of the robot. In other words, in, uh, in addition to just accelerating the mass of the uh, robot forward, we also have to accelerate the wheels. They're going to rotate faster and faster as we accelerate. Then we're going to uh, consider tau, w, uh, tau W3 required to overcome the rolling resistance of the robot's wheels. And finally, tau W4 required to overcome the bearing friction of the robot wheels. Jumping to the constant speed segment, where there is no acceleration, we include Again, tau W3 required to overcome the rolling resistance, and tau W4 required to overcome the bearing friction. Finally, during the deceleration segment, we include tau W1 required to decelerate the total mass of the robot, and tau W2 required to decelerate all four wheels of the robot. Note that during deceleration, the rolling resistance and bearing friction actually reduce the motor requirements. They help us slow down the robot. However, to be conservative, we assume that they're zeroed in this segment, because otherwise we'd have to uh, pick some minimum number that uh, we were sure they wouldn't be uh, uh, below. And it has very little effect, as it turns out, on selection of the motor, because the peak torque requirement actually occurs during the acceleration uh, segment. And uh, the time duration of the deceleration is very small compared to the total cycle, so it has very little uh, effect on the continuous torque. Okay, first, uh, our first um, rotary to linear conversion is the wheel, as Dan mentioned. It converts torque applied to the axle to a force applied to the mass of the robot. You can see the diagram. From the diagram, we see that torque applied to the wheel's axle generates a force uh, where the wheel makes contact to the floor. You can see as you step on the gas in your car, the uh, torque makes the wheel rotate. The wheel is pushing against the road and that produces a reaction force transmitted to the load via the axle bearing, and that's just the case we have here with our robot. Remembering that torque equals uh, the radius of the wheel times a force, and we know that just by thinking about a wrench. We know if we apply one foot of force, uh, one foot away from the uh, uh, center point of a wrench, we get one foot pound of torque. We can calculate the relationship between torque applied to the wheel's axle to the force applied to the robot. As we recommended in the earlier seminar, we would be using metric units, and we strongly recommend that you use uh, metric units also. You could look at our earlier seminar to see all the reasons we recommend that. Well, we're going to use metric, so we have to convert three inches to meters, and uh, that works out to be 0 0.0762 meters. We can substitute into, that, into our equation for torque and find that the torque in newton meters is 0 0.0762 times the force applied to the uh, robot. To find the torque required to accelerate the mass of the robot, tau W1, we must first determine the required force. We're all familiar with the uh, relationship F equals MA, uh, and that's what we'll use to calculate that force. 
and that works out to be just taking the mass of the robot and the acceleration that we uh, derived before, 3.125 meters per second square, that uh, the force is going to be 593.75 newtons. And now I want to point out that we show the calculation in a worksheet table with the columns of the table correspond to the equations above the table. Just looking at that top table for a minute, we have our equation F equals MA with the appropriate units. Underneath, you can see force, mass, and acceleration, and it's very easy for you to just go through, uh, use that equation and see how we derive the force in newtons. And it's going to be similar in the second table. From now on, I'm not going to go through the table or the calculations in detail because I think you can see that's very easy to do, very time consuming to describe, and um, it would actually be a good exercise if you want to go back and check our numbers and just look at the tables and see where we got the numbers. But I think we've made it very clear. The second equation in table used the relationship between torque and force found in the previous slide to calculate the torque, tau uh, W1, required to produce the required, uh, required force. We have that tau W1 equals 45.24 newton meters. We now calculate the torque, tau W2, required to accelerate the wheels. We use the relationship torque in newton meters equals the inertia of the wheels and it's actually all four wheels in this case, which so you have to accelerate all four of them. Uh, inertia in kilogram meter squares times the angular acceleration, the omega dt, in radians per second square. The omega dt is sometimes referred to as alpha. You may be more familiar with that term. So we have the inertia of all four wheels is uh, 0.0148 kilogram meter squared. And again, that was based on the manufacturer's data. The angular acceleration of the wheels, the omega dt, or alpha, is equal to the linear acceleration in meters per second squared divided by the radius. And that's shown in the proof box. I think it's uh, very straightforward. You just have to remember that one radian corresponds, uh, that an angle of one radian corresponds to a uh, distance across the circumference of one radius length. So if we're doing one radian per second, we're doing a speed of one radius length per second. And so if we're um, doing one radian per second, per, per second is the speed of one radian per second, and an acceleration, since radius is constant, uh, of one, one radian per second squared would be one radius length per second squared. But you can just go through that proof box to, to see that. Using the relationships developed on the previous slide and the known linear acceleration of 3.125 meters per second squared, we first calculate the angular acceleration, the omega dt, to be 41.01 radians per second square, and then the torque required to accelerate the wheels, tau w2, to be 0.61 newton meters. Ro uh, rolling resistance is the torque required to overcome losses in the tires. As the wheel uh, rotates, the tire deforms as the section in contact with the floor flattens. In pneumatic tires, the rolling resistance increases as the tire pressure decreases since there is more, deformis more deformation. We calculated the value of rolling resistance to be uh, 0 0.88, 0 0.88 newton meters based upon some typical values. Our approach is shown in the, in the appendix. Similarly, we calculated a value for the torque required to overcome bearing friction uh, to be 0 0.07 newton meters. And again, the approach is shown in the appendix. Uh, clearly, bearing friction is pretty negligible compared to the other torques. Well, we can now add up the torques for each of the segments to find the total wheel torques. We have, during the acceleration se uh, segment, tau w, that's the sum of all the torques, total wheel torque, is 46.81 newton meters. Constant, during the constant speed segment, tau w equals 0 0.95 newton meters. And during the deceleration segment, tau w equals 45.85 uh, newton meters. So we have the uh, torque of the uh, axle of the wheel, but now we must calculate the torque reflected back to the motor, uh, the, back to the motor shaft via the gearbox. To calculate, uh, calculate tau s, or the torque um, reflected back to the motor shaft, we uh, first divide the, the drive wheel torque by the gear reduction. 
We know that a 20 to 1 gear reduction should reduce the input torque by a factor of 20. However, there is some inefficiency that must be accounted for. So we then divide our result by an efficiency factor. Then we must add in two terms, one being the torque required to accelerate the gearbox itself, and the other a friction torque associated with the gearbox. We have that the gear reduction is 20 to 1, the efficiency is 90%, or 0.9, the gearbox inertia is 2.71 uh, times 10 to the minus fifth kilogram meters squared. The gearbox friction torque is 0 0.15 newton meters. And then, we, obviously, we have to take into account that the um, uh, motor speed is going to be 20 times the wheel speed. And also, the uh, gearbox speed will be 20 times the uh, wheel speed. Calculating the resulting motor shaft torque is shown in the table we have. During the acceleration segment, tau s equals 2.82 newton meters. That's going to be our peak torque. That's higher than any of the others. Constant, during the constant speed segment, the torque is only 0.25. That's just rolling resistance and bearing, bearing friction. And uh, during the deceleration segment, 2.57 newton meters. Now we have to add the torque required to accelerate the motor's inertia. We have to add that to the, uh, the sh uh, shaft torques that we've just uh, calculated. So the uh, torque to accelerate the uh, motor uh, is equal to the inertia of the motor times uh, the angular acceleration of the motor, or the omega motor dt. But at this point, we don't know what the motor inertia is because we haven't selected a motor. So this often ends up being an iterative process. We're going to select a motor see what its inertia is, add in the uh, torque required to accelerate the uh, motor's inertia, and see whether we're still within bounds. First thing we have to do is uh, do some calculations on the motor speed and acceleration. So using the formulas uh, shown here, we have that the uh, maximum wheel speed is 41.01 radians per second. Wheel acceleration, since we accelerate in one second, is 41.01 radians per second squared. The maximum motor speed is 820.2 radians per second. That's done by just multiplying the wheel speed by 20. And 820.2 radians per second works out to be 7,832 RPM, which is a critical number because we have to uh, look at our motor torque speed curve to see just how much torque, both peak and continuous, the motor has at that speed. So we're going to take a uh, look at one motor, the FPO207, uh, made by Infranor. Looking at the torque speed curve, we see that the motor has much higher peak torque capability. It's uh, 7,832 RPM than the 2.82 that we've calculated so far for the shaft torque. So we have a pretty good feel. We can probably add in the uh, torque required to accelerate the motor's inertia, but let's go through the calculations. So now adding the torque required to accelerate the motor's inertia of 1.3 uh, times 10 to the minus fourth, that's provided by the motor manufacturer, by the way, 1.3 times 10 to the minus fourth kilogram meter squared, um, and we multiply that by 820.2 radians per second squared, the motor's acceleration, we arrive at a peak torque requirement of 2.93 newton meters. Again, we just added that uh, acceleration torque to the torque we previously computed. We normally include a 10% safety factor. And uh, when we do that, we divide what we just calculated, 2.93 by 0.9, to come up with 3.26 newton meters. That's our peak torque requirement. And we, uh, looking at our torque speed curve, we see that we've still got plenty of margin. So we're, we're very, in very good shape regarding peak torque with this motor. However, we still have a couple more things to consider. We have to consider the uh, motor's continuous torque rating, or uh, sometimes called the, the RMS torque. It, basically, those are the same things. Torque RMS, tau RMS, determines the temperature rise of the motor over the complete profile. Exceeding a motor's tau RMS rating of a motor for a long period of time runs the risk of burning out the windings. As described in the previous webinar, tau RMS is equal to the following. It's the square root of the sum of 
each of the individual torque squared, the torque for each segment, the acceleration, the constant speed, uh, and the deceleration, each one squared and multiplied by the duration of that segment, and then divided by the total length of the segment. If you go through that calculation, all shown on this, uh, this slide, we substitute uh, the, the torque we have calculated for acceleration and multiply that by one second, the, the constant t speed segment lasting 31 seconds, so we multiply that torque by 31 seconds, and the deceleration uh, segment lasting one second, we calculate an RMS torque of 0 0.73 newton meters. Again, we'll include a 10% safety factor here, and that gives us 0 0.81 newton meters. Looking at the uh, torque speed curve for the FP0207, uh, we can see that uh, both our peak and our continuous torque requirements are met. So we're in good shape. We have a motor that can drive the load and handle the continuous torque and handle the peak torque. There's one other thing we're going to check. It's maybe not quite so obvious. Um, we're going to look at the inertia match or the ratio of the uh, motor inertia to the load inertia. I'm sorry, the load inertia to the, to the motor inertia. So a big, big load inertia would give us a, a high inertia match. Uh, let's say it's 20 times the motor inertia. We'd have a uh, inertia match or ratio of 20 to 1. Now, why do we care about that? Well, the reason is that the robot controller would typically include a positioning loop. Uh, or positioning servo designed to follow a motion profile similar to the one shown in our timing diagram for the traction drive. Servo performance, usually measured in settling time, how quickly a servo responds to an input and how quickly it settles in when the command, uh, a position command reaches a final position, and also uh, very related uh, bandwidth, servo bandwidth relates to settling time. High bandwidth relates to fast settling time and vice versa. So servo performance is affected by many factors, one of them being server, the uh, mechanical stiffness of the system, but the one that we're going to consider uh, here is the inertia match, or the ratio of the load inertia to the motor inertia. I'm going to give you some very rough rules of thumb for this inertia ratio. Probably the fastest uh, servo system that I've ever worked on in my career was used for placing semiconductor chips on printed circuit boards. You can imagine these surface bound ships, you know how tiny they are, they have to put them on a board with very, very tight tolerances, and these people want to put as many chips on per minute as they possibly can. So they're looking for very high throughput, and uh, that means very fast settling times and very high bandwidths. So in those applications, they're usually looking at a uh, inertia match or the ratio of the inertia load to the uh, inertia of the motor of one to two, typically and they achieve settling times of a few milliseconds and velocity loop bandwidths of maybe 100 to 200 hertz and sometimes even higher. Less demanding applications will allow a slower response time and lower bandwidth with response time increasing with the uh, inertia match. Now we're looking at a traction drive application and uh, we're going to show some analysis in a minute that will indicate that we can live with much lower bandwidths. Something as low as maybe 5 to 10 uh, hertz bandwidth and, and, um, and there's sort of, uh, matches of maybe 30 or possibly even a little bit higher than that. This is a plot of a typical position loops response for three different bandwidths, 5 hertz, 10 hertz, and 20 hertz. First, the red section of the uh, plot is the velocity profile, the commanded velocity profile. That isn't the profile that the servo actually achieves, it's what is commanded uh, by some sort of a motion control, probably a computer inside the uh, robot's control uh, section. You can see that it accelerates at exactly the rate that uh, we want our traction motor to accelerate at 3.125 meters per second square. It reaches 3.125 meters per second in one second. In, our, in, in this case, it's going to run for just one second at 3.125 meters per second. That was just to keep the plot on the page so I can show you all the details here. Uh, but that really makes no difference in terms of our final settling times, the things we're really interested in here. And then it will decelerate at the same rate that uh, 
uh, our traction motor is going to decelerate at, or our robot is going to decelerate at. So it's very similar to our, uh, uh, our application. Next, the uh, commanded position, which is the uh, curve on the left of the sort of S-shaped curves, um, that is the input to our position servo. And, and uh, corresponding exactly to the velocity profile. Again, that would be generated by a computer that would be effectively integrating the velocity profile to generate the position profile, and it would uh, output that profile to a position loop. And uh, finally, we see the, uh, or emphasize the three uh, tr tracking responses of the servo loop. You can say they don't follow the commanded position exactly, but they follow them pretty closely. And in fact, the 10 hertz and the 20 hertz uh, bandwidth servos look like they're pretty darn close to the, uh, the commanded position. You can also see that the 5 hertz is a little bit farther away. It's got a bigger tracking error. And um, what we're really interested in is the area, the settling area, when we reach our final position. We're going to expand that, that area, as shown in the, uh, the highlighted circle, to show uh, in more detail just exactly how the three different loops settle. Again, remember, the uh, commanded position reaches final value right after three seconds. The, uh, ideally, it would like you to be right there at the end of three seconds, but the servo isn't going to do that precisely. So we'll expand that in this slide. And you can see that um, the uh, 10 and 20 hertz uh, loops at the end of three seconds they're actually within about a quarter of an inch. Uh, the the uh, 20 hertz is essentially within a, less than a tenth of an inch of the final position after, uh, at, at three seconds. And the uh, uh, 10 hertz loop is about a quarter of an inch away. However, the 5 hertz loop is about an inch and a half away. So uh, if you were moving a pallet, you might not want to raise or lower the pallet right away. But you can see after just a tenth of a second later, the servo settled out. And now it is within less than half an inch or just about a half an inch of the final position. And if you wait two tenths of a second after uh, the commanded profile is reached, it, you're dead nuts there. You could certainly lower or raise the pallet. So the implication is you could have a pretty low bandwidth. Uh, at worst, you might want to wait a couple tenths of a second before raising or lowering the pallet after you've commanded the robot to be in a, a certain position. That's all we're going to say about inertia matching um, here. But now we have to calculate the inertia match. Well, the wheel converts the total mass of the robot to an equivalent uh, reflected inertia as seen by the wheel's axle. That may not be uh, totally obvious, but uh, we'll go into some justification, and there's a, a pretty clear proof in the uh, proof box. But the equivalent inertia uh, at the wheel axis uh, that's uh, caused by the mass of the robot, the total mass of the robot, is given by the inertia J in kilogram meters squared is equal to the mass of the robot in kilograms times the radius of the wheel in meters squared. One way to think about why the mass is converted to an inertia is to um, think that to accelerate the wheel, we must, must apply torque to the axle. But for the wheel to accelerate, the load must be accelerated. So for a bigger load, more mass of the robot, it's going to take more torque to accelerate the wheel. Well, considering the relationship uh, or the definition of inertia, uh, J equals torque divided by the angular acceleration, the omega dt or alpha, that, looks, uh, that makes the mass really look just like an inertia as far as the, whatever mechanism is, mechanism is driving the uh, wheel, what that would see. So uh, really, a bigger mass as far as the mechanism driving the axle of the wheel just looks like a, a bigger inertia and the relationship is given there. And I think the proof is quite straightforward. And uh, we don't have time to cover it here, but I think you can go back and it'll work out very easily. Using that formula, J equals uh, in kilogram meters squared equals mass in kilograms times the radius in meters, uh, the radius uh, in meters squared, we have the, the inertia reflected back uh, from the robot's mass is 1.10 kilogram meters squared. We have to add the inertia of all four wheels, and that's because uh, 
the, the, the mass, the inertia we calculated before, is really just the uh, effect of accelerating linearly the total mass of the world, but does not include accelerating rotationally the wheel. So we have to add the uh, wheel inertia in, and that gives us a total inertia of 1.11 kilogram meters squared. That's the total inertia reflected back to the gearbox, which is driving the axle or the wheel. So we have one more step. Now, how is that inertia, the, the 1.11 kilogram meter squared that we just calculated, how is that reflected back through the gearbox to the motor? For a gearbox with an n-to-one reduction, the inertia reflected to the input of the gearbox from an inertia connected to the output is given by inertia in equals inertia out divided by n square. So a 20 to 1 gear reduction will give you a 400 uh, to 1 reduction in the reflected inertia. Again, I'm not going to go into the proof in detail. It's straightforward, and it's in the uh, highlighted proof box on, that, uh, on the slide. So using inertia in, uh, the input of the gearbox to the uh, load inertia divided by the gearbox uh, gear reduction ratio n squared, we have that the inertia reflected back to the uh, input of the gearbox or reflected back to the motor is 27.75 times 10 to the minus fourth kilogram meters squared. Now we have to add the inertia of the gearbox, and we get a total inertia reflected back to the motor of uh, 28.02 times 10 to the minus fourth kilogram meters squared. So that gives us an inertia ratio of 21.6 to 1. So we're nowhere near the one to two that we require for its, uh, putting some exactors on a PC board, but it looks like we're plenty good enough for a traction motor. So we feel that that motor is plenty good for this application. Okay, we've got a motor uh, that we're happy with for the traction drive, now on to the lift drive. Summarizing, the lift platform and load have a total mass of 69 kilograms. The lift is driven by a ball screw, Selection of the ball screw's pitch to 5 millimeters uh, per rev will be just discussed shortly. And the inertia and friction of the selected ball screw is provided by the manufacturer and are shown in the diagram. Repeating the, ti uh, di uh, excuse me, repeating the timing diagram for the lift system, we note that the peak lift speed is 10 inches per second, and that the uh, uh, change in speed is accomplished uh, in uh, 0 0.6 seconds. So our acceleration is going to be the 10 inches per second divided by 0 0.6. So in the slide are the calculations used to derive the peak motor speed of uh, 3,048 RPM and also the peak ball screw, screw acceleration of 532 radians per second square. Again, the calculations are straightforward and um, I don't think you'll have any trouble following the calculations. The key numbers are the motor RPM and the motor's acceleration, and uh, ball screw and motor acceleration, because again, the, I should have mentioned the ball screw is directly driven by the uh, motor in this case. There is no gear reduction. So the 532 radians per second square corresponds to the motor acceleration and the uh, ball screw acceleration. Well, we have another form of um, rotary to linear conversion, the ball screw converts the motor's rotation to linear motion of the platform and load, and the motor's torque to force applied to the platform and load. The relationship between motor torque and force applied to the load by the ball screw is given by torque in newton meters is equal to the pitch of the lead screw in meters per rev divided by 2 pi, that quantity all multiplied by the uh, force that we apply to the load. In this case, the load is the uh, platform and the uh, uh, and the uh, load on top of the platform. Deriving this relationship util utilizes the energy uh, conserva uh, energy conservation concept: power in equals power out, where rotary power in uh, is equal to tau times omega, and linear power out is equal to force times velocity. And uh, that is used at the start of the proof in the uh, uh, highlighted box. I won't go into it in detail, but again, I think it's very straightforward to follow it. We see from the relationship between torque and force that the lower the pitch, the less the torque, uh, the less torque is required to apply a given force. On the other hand, the lower the pitch, the higher the motor uh, 
and ball screw speed. This sounds a lot like we were talking about with the gear reduction. So uh, why did we pick a, a pitch of five millimeters, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, five millimeters per rib? Well, basically, we wanted a uh, very low pitch because we wanted a, a big effective gear reduction. In other words, a lot of motor speed um, for uh, a given movement of the load that gives us a low uh, a torque requirement for the motor so we can use a smaller motor. Again, our brushless motors can go at high speed. In, in this case, though, the uh, maximum, uh, the, the maximum uh, ball screw speed limited the piss to five millimeters per rev. So that was basically the smallest we could use. The, the speed uh, that we got, the uh, little over 3,000 RPM is no problem at all for the motor, but it was beginning to be a problem for the ball, ball screw. We now have to look at three forces to determine the lift force. We have gravitational force. Anytime we're supporting or raising or lowering the load, there's always gravity pushing down, and our motor is going to have to be pushing up to overcome that. We have to worry about the acceleration, deceleration forces. We're accelerating the load up until we reach the 10 inches per second, and that sometimes we decelerate it, uh, so we consider those forces, and finally, friction forces. First, looking at the gravitational force, we use F equals MA, and we calculate the force of gravity for the loaded platform to be uh, 676.89 newtons. Again, we have the mass. We know that if we let the load go, it would accelerate at the uh, gravitational rate, and um, that gives us what the force is, that the force of gravity is applying to the, uh, the, the uh, load. Since the uh, motor will always be holding the load up against this force, we treated uh, the, the gravitational component of the uh, motor torque to be positive. Now we calculate the acceleration forces during each segment of the lift cycle. Note here that we must be careful of the signs when analyzing the lift system because in some cases gravity will work with us, in some cases will be working against us. We first calculate the load acceleration in the top table. We just use acceleration is equal to end speed minus start speed divided by the duration, change in speed over change in time, and the calculations are in the table there. Then in the lower table, we make use of the um, F equals MA and calculate what the force is for each of the segments in the lift cycle. In the next slide, we do exactly the same thing for the drop cycle. Now we add the gravitational force and the acceleration forces and convert the uh, result into a torque. So in the upper table, we just combine gravity and uh, acceleration. Note the signs, because we had to be careful of signs of when gravity was helping us and when it was hurting us. In the lower table, we use the conversion factor we worked out for the uh, lead screws to calculate the resulting torque. And again, similar calculations are shown for the drop cycle. Now we have to uh, calculate the torque required to accelerate the ball screw for each segment of the lift cycle. Um, well, we have, to, we have to, I'm sorry, we have to calculate the torque required to accelerate the ball screw. On uh, this uh, slide, we do that for the lift cycle. We had previously calculated that the uh, motor and ball screw acceleration was uh, plus or minus 532 radians per second square. And uh, we've added that now to the uh, torques uh, that were computed in the earlier tables. And we do the same thing for the drop cycle. Finally, we have to include ball screw efficiency and friction torques to find the required uh, motor shaft torque for the lift cycle. To be conservative, we didn't include the inefficiency and friction in the drop cycle since energy is always being taken out of the load. So we can use the values previously calculated for the drop cycle. We see that the peak torque requirement occurs during the lift cycle and is 0 0.83 newton meters. Also note that the torque required during the 100 meter traverse when the load is being held at constant height with no acceleration 
is the same as the torque required during uh, the period segment T2, or 0 0.75 newton meters when there is no acceleration. T2 was the constant speed segment in the uh, uh, lift cycle. And so we can just use that value when we're computing the RMS torque. We have to include the torques for all the segments. Summarizing the key numbers, we will use to tentatively select a motor. We have a maximum motor speed of 3,048 RPM, a motor shaft uh, peak torque of 0 0.83 newton meters, and a peak motor acceleration of 532 radians per second squared. So again, we're going to uh, select a motor, and uh, later we're going to have to look at the motor acceleration torque, but we're going to consider the uh, Infranor FB0105 for this application. And we see that it has plenty of peak torque margin at 3048 RPM. But now we have to include the torque required to accelerate the motor. And we have from the manufacturer that the inertia is uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 5th kilogram meter squared. And going through similar calculations as we did for the traction motor, we get that the motor torque tau m required for each segment of the lift cycle. Note that 0 0.85 newton meters during the acceleration segment represents the uh, peak or highest motor torque. And doing a similar thing for the drop cycle. We don't have any uh, torques that are as high as the uh, acceleration cycle, but we will have to include those when we work out the uh, continuous or RMS torque. So we have uh, included all the torques, but now we want to include our 10% safety factor, and that gives us a, a, a peak torque requirement, again, during the acceleration portion of the lift cycle of 0 0.94 newton meters. Looking at the uh, torque speed curve, we can see that, that we're well within range of the uh, peak torque. The peak torque capability of the motor, that's the blue curve, so we're uh, way below that. No problem with the peak torque. But we still have to calculate the RMS torque, and we do that in exactly the same manner we did uh, in the uh, case of the traction motor, and get a uh, tau RMS is equal to 0 0.74 newton meters. But we have to include our 10% safety factor, so we again divide by 0 0.9 to get 0 0.82 newton meters. Looking at the torque speed curve, we can see that we're not way below the continuous torque, but we've included our 10% safety factor, and we are below the continuous torque grading. So we feel we're OK, because again, we put in our 10% uh, safety factor. And again, we haven't made use of the fact that friction and uh, um, inefficiencies actually reduce the motor torque during the, uh, when we're lowering the load. One thing that's uh, we should consider is that uh, if you have a very long period, uh, a very long segment, I should say, like the constant speed segment, during that entire segment, the uh, uh, lift uh, motor is having to support the load. And that requires a fairly high torque. If you have a long segment like that, something like 33 seconds, if you were way above the continuous torque for that period, you could burn out the motor windings. Fortunately, in our case, it works out that um, even with a 10% safety factor, we're just below the uh, continuous torque. And since it's holding the uh, load stationary, we can look at the continuous torque rating at zero speed, which is always higher than the continuous torque rating at uh, higher speed, as you can see from the torque speed curve. So we're still OK. Sometimes, in some applications, if, the, if the, uh, you had a long segment with a torque that was significantly higher than the continuous torque rating, you could have a problem. So we're uh, satisfied that the, uh, this motor satisfies our peak and continuous torque requirements. The one last thing that we have to calculate is the uh, inertia match. Again, just thinking about uh, servo performance. Well, the mass driven by the ball screw is converted to an equivalent reflected inertia at the input to the screw, and it's given by the reflected inertia, it was the inertia that 
the motor driving the screw sees is equal to the pitch of the ball screw divided by 2 pi, all squared, times the load in kilograms. And that's the pitch in meters per rev. The proof makes use of the definition of inertia. Uh, it's that the inertia in kilogram meter squared is equal to the torque divided by torque in newton meters divided by the angular acceleration v omega dc in radians per second, uh, radians per second squared. I'm sorry, and it's presented in the shaded box. Again, it's relatively straightforward to follow, and in the interest of time, we won't go through it. But using this relationship. In substituting uh, our load and pitch, we find that the uh, load is, uh, the, the J reflected back to the motor, or J load, is equal to 4.37 times 10 to the minus fifth. But we have to add the inertia of the lead screw, and that gives us the total inertia ref reflected back to the motor of 1.44 times uh, 10 to the minus fourth. So the inertia of the uh, motor that we've selected, the FP0105, is 4 times 10 to the minus fifth. So we can now calculate the inertia match, which works out to be 3.6 to 1, ratio of the load inertia to the uh, motor inertia. So that's good. That's, we could uh, have a really fast selling time on our, our lift motor, even though we probably don't need one. But a real consideration was the uh, meeting the peak and continuous torque requirements. So congratulations. You have now successfully selected motors suitable for traction, for the traction drive and the lift drive. Now Jack Curl will discuss the selection of drives suitable for the, um, for the motors. Thanks, Bob. Pardon me. Hello, everyone. This is Jack Curl, and I'll be reviewing the drive selection process. To select the appropriate drive power level, you only need to determine the voltage available, the peak current required, and the continuous current required. The voltage required is determined by the customer. In this example, we have 168 volt DC available coming from a battery supply. The current required is determined by the motor's torque sensitivity, also known as KT. KT is defined as the amount of torque the motor can produce per amp of current and is based on the winding selected during the motor selection process. Please note, the motor inductance, drive bus voltage, and drive PWM frequency determine how much PWM current ripple you will see in the motor. The drive has a minimum value allowed for stable operation. Check the drive specifications for this value. If the motor inductance is too low for the drive, you can change the drive PWM frequency You'll have to derate the drive um, to do that, or add external inductors to the motor leads to reduce the ripple current. Since current in amps RMS is equal to torque in newton meters divided by the motor's KT in, in newton meters per amps RMS, and since the traction motor KT is 0 0.16 newton meters per amp RMS, then we need a peak rated current of 2.93 divided by 0 0.16 or 18.3 amps RMS. And we need a continuous current of 0 0.81 divided by 0 0.16 or 5.1 amps RMS. So we need a drive that can supply at least 18.3 amps peak and 5.1 amps continuous. We chose a pack AK400-20 to do the job with 20 amps peak and 10 amps continuous. The motor inductance is 0 0.2 millihenry and is below the drive specification for standard PWM frequency um, as minimum inductance. To accommodate for the low inductance, we needed to increase the PWM frequency and reduce the drive rated continuous current. So 10 amps RMS is reduced to 7 amps RMS continuous, and even with this derating, there's plenty of current available. Looking at the torque speed curve, the red and violet dotted lines represent the motor and drive system limits. Notice we could select a higher power drive to get more power out of this same motor, although that would increase the drive weight, size, and cost. Using the same process for the lift drive, 
This time the KT is 0.29 newton meters per amp RMS. So the required current is 3.24 amps RMS peak and 2.86 amps RMS continuous. So we need a drive that can supply at least 3.24 amps peak and 2.86 amps continuous. We chose a PAC AK400 08 drive to handle this requirement. It can supply 8 amps RMS peak and 4 amps RMS continuous. This drive can handle 1.3 millihenry at the normal PWM frequency, so no derating is required. Note there are other criteria to selecting a drive, such as field bus compatibility, STO requirements, feedback options, and more you can contact the manufacturer for assistance. For more details on selecting a drive, please see the appendix on drive selection. Thank you for attending and please stay online for Q&A. All right, a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. While our presenters are answering your questions, please take a moment to answer the feedback form that will appear on your screen. If you have pop-up blocker, we ask that you disable it so that you can receive that form. So first question, um, the thermistor properly connected should protect the motor, correct? But the position loop will go open loop. So that, that's um, a question about the motor PTC or NTC, whichever is used in the motor. Uh, this is Jack Curl. I can take that question. Um, the PTC has a... Um, a sensor in it to measure the temperature of the motor and so if the current of the motor is above the motor's current rating for a certain amount of time the motor will heat up and the PTC is used to protect against the motor overheating. But the motor um, winding has a, a fairly long thermal time constant and if you are excessively putting in current into the motor for a longer period of time, the PTC may not react to that quick enough to protect the motor. So most drives have an I2T functionality in them built in to protect the motor in that situation. Where there's a lot of peak current. Where there's a lot of peak current um, for a long period of time. Sure. Okay. And what if the traction gear reduction was done with belts instead of a gearbox? Okay, I'll, this is Bob Comstock. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in terms of servo performance is that to get good performance, uh, the, the stiffer the system, the better. And clearly, belts are not terribly stiff. They're very inexpensive. It's a great way of getting gear reduction. But um, you might get away in a traction drive with belts. It would be something you'd really have to analyze. But belts um, in servo systems are a major source of problem. Number one, they're not stiff. So uh, you get relatively low speed resonance where the belt, sometimes the belt oscillates in different modes and that can cause servo uh, systems to go very unstable. Uh, so you have to be careful with belts. Okay. And um, how long can it run? How much time can you spend at peak torque? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, it's, it's a complicated question in that, uh, let's say that you were running at continuous torque for a long period of time where your motor is already pretty hot. It's within range, but it's pretty hot. Um, now, if you put peak in, it's going to, uh, the winding is going to heat up quite quickly. And uh, since they're already probably pretty close to their limit, you wouldn't want to be there very long at all. The general rule of thumb uh, is you don't want to run at peak for more than uh, a few seconds. But again, that would depend. If the motor was stone cold, you were really uh, had an easy application for, except for a few moments of peak, uh, you might be able to get by with uh, several seconds at peak. But if it's already hot, you probably don't want to be at peak for more than a second. Okay. Um, when you move the load down vertically, do you worry about regeneration? Okay. Um, yeah, we can we can answer that. This is Jack Curl. Um, normally, you would consider regeneration um, for higher speed applications, like the one we have is 8,000 RPM for the traction drive. 
and uh, you would consider the regeneration because the um, the energy that's put back into the motor is based on the inertia and the square of the speed. And so the higher speed uh, applications make more energy by the square of the ratio of the speed. And so you would worry about that in a normal application that um, the energy going into the motor would have to go back into the drive as well, and that energy would pump up the bus voltage until you get an over-voltage fault in the drive, unless you have a regen resistor system in the drive. Uh, and sizing the regen resistor uh, is something the factory can help you do uh, based on the energy that's calculated into the system. In our application that we sized, it was a battery application, and all of the energy is going to be dumped into the battery, which means it's just going to recharge the battery and be stored there for later use. Like a Prius. Yeah, like a Prius. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I think we can squeeze in one more question here. How do you determine the drive derating percentage? Okay, this is Jack Curl again. I believe that's related to changing the PWM frequency to the higher PWM frequency. And um, that is determined by the drive design team. Um, so the drive manufacturer will allow you sometimes to change the PWM frequency on the drive. And if you double the PWM frequency, typically you have to reduce the rated current by 30%. But if you have other increments of increasing the PWM frequency, you have to contact the manufacturer to determine, to determine how to derate the drive. All right, very well. Well, I'm afraid that we've run out of time. On behalf of the Pensions Design Engineering and Sourcing Group, I'd like to thank you for joining the webcast today. Thank you to Infranor for sponsoring this event for us today. Have a productive remainder of the day. Thank you. Thank you.